Welcome back to the Three Months of Modal Logic, the sequel to 100 Days of Logic here with Cardinalities.org. Today, we are almost at the end of our three plus months of modal logic, looking at the final 10 days of logic. Today, we are going to be looking at belief revision logic, a basic introduction to the logic of belief revision and AGM. This is kind of the advanced doxastic logic that we're looking at. And it's going to be pretty complicated, but we are only going to touch lightly on it in this video. So, the logic of belief revision is a complex subject. A full treatment of it requires an understanding of set theory. And I don't like to go over anything in these videos that I haven't covered in another video so that you can reference back to it. So, we are hopefully going to come back to this concept after we have done a bigger treatment of set theory, maybe in the next series on logic. In this video, though, we're only going to scratch the surface and provide you with the basic elements of belief revision logic. In a future series, hopefully, we're going to provide a more in-depth description of this logic. But for now, hold on and let's get going. So the system that we'll be exploring here is known as AGM after its three founders. In this video, we will define and explore the following concepts. Logical consequence, belief sets, expansion, contraction, remainders, recovery, and revision. So, first off, consequence. In the logic of belief revision, one generally does not assess beliefs that are actually possessed. This is a problem that we ran into with doxastic logic because a lot of times people believe pretty ridiculous things. And they often believe contradictions or they believe in the laws of non-classical logic as opposed to the laws of classical logic and this poses a lot of problems for kind of trying to construct a logic of belief. So usually for belief revision theory we look at what is called a belief set which is a combination of all of your beliefs and all of the logical consequences of your beliefs, as well as any tautologies, because anything, of course, implies a tautology. This is not claiming that you have these beliefs, but rather that you are logically committed to them. As before, this is going to be interesting and may have some problems with people who don't necessarily believe in the laws of classical logic, but perhaps are skeptic and have no beliefs, or are some of the beliefs in non-classical laws of logic. So there may be some problems here, but for now, taking this as a general generic dogmatist that believes in classical logic, we can move forward. So if your only belief is P, for example, then your belief set would include P and all of the logical implications of P as well as all of the laws of logic, or all the tautologies. So these would include things like P or Q, R implies P, and so on. To define this logically, we will take a function that operates over sets of beliefs. It's going to be CN, or the consequence function. So we'll take CNA as the set of all of the logical consequences of the set of beliefs A. Note that this will include all of the things that already are in A, and it's going to have a few other properties as well. So as I just said, inclusion is going to be one of the properties of our consequence operator. So all members of A are members of the consequences of A. Basically, A is a subset of the consequences of A. It's also going to have monotony. If all members of A are members of B, then all members of the consequences of A are going to be members of the consequences of B. If A is a subset of B, then the consequences of A are a subset of the consequences of B. And it's also going to have iteration as a property. So the consequences of A is identical to the consequences of the consequences of A. Because the consequences of A include all of the logical consequences. They don't just include one step of the logical consequences of the beliefs held in A. And so to do the consequence operation more than once is simply superfluous. Now, a belief set 
is going to be defined as some collection of beliefs can only be defined as a belief set if the consequences of that set are identical to the set. So a belief set is something that already includes all of the consequences of any belief included in that set. Or in other words, if all of the logical consequences of the beliefs are already included in the set, then it is a belief set. All belief sets include all of the tautologies and all the laws of logic. As noted before, this is a significant problem for people that don't believe in classical logic. But I've gotten into that in greater detail in my series on doxastic logic. Check that out if you're interested. But for now, we're just going to keep moving. So the operators that are going to be used for the leaf revision logic are generally going to be three. There are some others, but the three main ones are expansion, adding beliefs to some set of beliefs, which do not contradict something already there. Expansion is the simplest of the operators. Contraction, removing beliefs and their consequences from a set. And revision, adding one belief which contradicts some other belief in the system and removing those other beliefs that don't mesh with that belief to keep the system coherent. Right? What we're going to do next is look at each of these operators in turn and see how they apply to sets of beliefs. So expansion first is the simplest. It can be defined as the consequences of the set, which includes all of the elements of the original belief set and the new proposition. If your belief set B was only one belief, P, and all of its consequences, then if you expanded it to include Q, then B plus Q would include P q and all of their consequences so to be clear b plus q is going to be defined as the expansion of b by q which includes all of the consequences of anything already in b and all of the consequences of q as well note that this only works when q doesn't directly contradict something already in the belief set because if it does, we're going to have to revise our belief set as opposed to just expanding. Next up is contradiction, and contradiction is going to be more complicated. If you want to get rid of some P from your belief system, you also need to get rid of the consequences of P, or at least the consequences of P which were only derived from P. Because you might have in your system P, Q, and P, or Q implies R, and then have, via the consequence operation, the proposition R. But just because you're removing P, it doesn't mean necessarily that you need to remove R, because even though R is a possible consequence of P, you still have Q in your system. So you might want to hold on to R as well. There's going to be a lot of debate around what exactly you should and shouldn't remove when you're getting rid of P. But the bigger problem that's going to be talked about more is that not that the consequences of P must be eliminated, but that the propositions which imply P must also be removed, since if we just got rid of P, but not the things that imply it, P would still be part of our belief set, even if you didn't believe it, since we would be logically committed to it. If you had Q and Q implies P in your belief set and just got rid of P, you're still logically committed to P, unless you've gotten rid of modus ponens. But noting, as we did at the beginning, that you have to have all of those tautologies and the rules of logic in your belief system for this to work, you're going to have a little bit of a problem. This is going to lead to the problem of underdetermination. If you don't know what that is, check out my series. A theory is just a theory on it. Some cool stuff in there. If we have in our belief sets, as I said, P, Q, and Q implies P, and we want to contract the set of beliefs by P, we must get rid of either Q or Q implies P, but we don't need to get rid of both. And we want to keep as much information as we can, so we probably don't want to get rid of both. We are underdetermined as to which we should get rid of. This is exactly the problem of underdetermination that we deal with in the series. So, the belief revision theorists are going to try to get around this by coming up with a theory of remainders and creating a function over remainders which picks the best beliefs to hold on to but inherently as we note in the problem of underdetermination there's not going to be a rational way to do this so i'm a little concerned but 
let's take a look at the actual theory before I get too much into my objections to it. So when contracting, it is assumed that we want to get rid of as few statements as possible, or we want to maintain as much information as we can. Any of the sets which maximize the amount of information or propositions which are maintained with the contraction are elements of the remainder set and are called remainders. B, that kind of contradiction sign P, is going to mean the remainder set of B. Note that this is not just the set of all propositions that can stick around, but it's in fact a set of sets. It's a set of possible belief sets that maximize retention while still not implying P. So for a basic example that may be a little oversimplified, but hopefully will give you a sense, if our set of beliefs B includes P, Q, R, Q implies P and their consequences, and we want to contract B by P, then the set of beliefs Q and R and their consequences, and the set of beliefs R and Q implies P and their consequences would be members of the remainder set B, P. Well, the set of just R and its consequences would not be, since it does not maximize the propositions retained. And Q, R, and Q implies P and their consequences would not be either, since P is still a consequence. So remainder sets are the sets of sets of beliefs that maximize the amount of information we hold on to while still getting rid of whatever the proposition we don't want is, whatever we're contracting our set of beliefs by. Which remainder set should we pick? Therein lies the rub. So, there are various rules which tell us which remainder set we should count as B contracted by P. Often some combination of remainders is proposed. There are various different functions that people have proposed to do this. However, I am skeptical that there is any truly rational way to determine which elements are kept and which are not. For more information on this concern, watch my series on underdetermination entitled A Theory is Just a Theory, particularly the video asking the question, is science rational? Should give you a good sense of why this is actually quite a significant problem. We're not going to get into all of the different functions and ways that people want to exactly define the way that a belief set is contracted, but just understand that it's going to be some set of these remainders. Whatever the exact system we use for determining which beliefs to keep, rational or not, there are several conditions that any such function must fulfill. Closure. B contracted by P should include all of the logical consequences of B contracted by P. It should be a belief set, basically. Success. So long as P is not a tautology, because if we try to contract a set by a tautology, we still have to include the tautology in the set, because as we stated in our definition of belief sets, they have to include all laws of logic, so all tautologies, then B contracted by P should not include P. Inclusion, B contracted by P, should be a subset of B. We should not have any new propositions included. If we contract by something, that shouldn't mean that suddenly we gain another proposition. We're not revising our set, we're contracting it. That's an important difference, and we'll get to revision in a moment. Vacuity, if P is not a consequence of B, then B contracted by P should just be B. So if we don't say P or anything related to P in our belief set. Contracting our belief set by P means that we just maintain our belief set. Nothing happens. Equivalence. If it is a tautology that P and Q are materially equivalent, then B contracted by P should be equal to B contracted by Q. Note that if P and Q are materially equivalent is not a tautology, but merely one of your beliefs, this is not going to hold. And we're going to once again have the problem of underdetermination of should you throw out P or should you throw out the equivalents? An interesting question. And finally, recovery, which is the most controversial, which is that B is a subset of B contracted by P plus P. Basically, if we add P back after removing it, B can be recovered as a full set. We shouldn't have lost any of the pieces of information that we lost when we contracted B by P. Now, most of the conditions for contraction are quite intuitive and unproblematic, but recovery is going to be a 
problem. It has some concerning ramifications. So imagine that you have the beliefs that Trey is a musician and Trey is a rapper. If you contract your beliefs by M, you must also remove R, since R implies M. If Trey is a rapper, that implies he's a musician. So if you contract by M, you also have to contract by R, because R implying M is at least an analytic truth, if not arguably a tautology. However, if you later discover that Trey is a classical pianist, you must recover your belief that M. But it does not seem to imply that you should recover R2. Because discovering that Trey is a classical pianist, while it implies that he's a musician, surely doesn't imply that he is a rapper. Just because Trey is a classical pianist, it does not imply that he's a rapper, and yet recovery is going to require us to recover all of those old beliefs that we had when we contracted our belief set by M. This is one of many problems with recovery, and it's going to play into the problems with whatever function we pick for choosing exactly how we're going to contract our belief systems. As I said, this is a basic introduction, so we're not going to go into this, but enough to say that this is still a viable problem for belief revision logic. Now, on to revision itself. So the final operation we're going to look at is revision. Revision occurs when you add some belief P to your belief set, and it causes you to revise and change your previous beliefs, because probably there's a contradiction with that belief somewhere in your belief set. Revision can be defined in terms of our other operators via something known as the Levi identity. So B revised by P is equal to B contracted by not P, plus P. Okay? Hopefully that makes sense. Now, as with contraction, revision will have certain conditions that it should obey. So, closure, once again, it needs to be a belief set. It needs to be logically closed. There can't be any propositions which are a logical consequence of anything in B revised by P that are not included in B revised by P. It should have success. B revised by P should include P. That was the whole point. We want to put P in our belief system. Vacuity is, again, if not P is not a member of v, B, then B revised by P should just be identical to B plus P. Note that this looks very similar to the vacuity that we noted a moment ago with contraction, but here it adds the plus P because that's the second operation we're doing for revision. Consistency. If P is consistent, it's not contradictory, it's not a contradiction, basically, it's not the opposite of a tautology, then B revised by P should be consistent as well, because, of course, if we're forcing us to put P in there, it might be the case that if P wasn't consistent, that B would end up not being consistent either. Equivalence. If P being materially equivalent to Q is a logical truth, then B revised by P is identical to B revised by Q. Once again, this is very similar to the equivalence condition that we had earlier. And finally, inclusion. B revised by P should be a subset of B plus P, meaning it can be equal to B plus P, but it can't be more than B plus P. We can't have added things by contracting B by not P. Okay? Hopefully all of those make some degree of sense. As I said, in the future, we will hopefully do a series in much more depth on this, but that's going to be after we cover some set theory to better understand these ideas. So, there's much more to be said about the logic of belief revision, but hopefully this video has provided you with a basic introduction to some of the concepts and operations that are used. As always, check out the SEP, the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy has a fantastic article on belief revision for more information. And, as always, stay tuned for more videos on this subject and many, many subjects of logic in the future. This is only the 199th video we've done in various series on modal logic and normal basic logic. Don't worry, there's many more to come. Up next, 10 perplexing puzzles for the master modal logician. 
we are going to be putting your modal logic skills to the test with the final video of the three months of modal logic, looking at some modal logic puzzles in all the different types of modal logics that we have covered and seeing if you can solve them. Watch this video and more here at Carnades.org and stay skeptical, everybody.